Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep, it's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah, I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. Come, walk down the winding path. Don't mind the spooks and monsters. They stay hidden within the trees. There are mysteries in this world that you need to know, and paranormal truths that need to be told. Come, step up into the caravan, where we share tales of old, as well as new accounts about things you thought only existed in your nightmares. Tonight, we are welcomed by Ron Murphy, who has been investigating the stuff of nightmares for over 30 years. He has investigated the things that go bump in the night and meticulously researched the historical and psychological context of myths and legends from around the world. Ron seeks to uncover the archetypal president for the monsters that haunt our collective thoughts. He has appeared on the Red Earth Uncovered documentary series as a cryptozoologist, as well as in various small town monsters productions as a cryptozoologist and historian and on the Travel Channel series True Terror with Robert England, in which he shared his knowledge of the paranormal within a historical context. All right. Well, welcome inside the caravan. I am so excited to have you with me here this evening. I'm very happy to be here with you this evening. We actually <laughs> talked about this for a while, but life gets in the way as it tends to, it tends to happen. Yes. So finally now, after a month talking about it, <laughs> we're finally in the same virtual world together. I know, right? I love it. This is just, I mean, it, it has been a whirlwind since we met. It is so crazy, you know, for the audience preface that we ended up meeting actually at the Dogman conference that was held by Paranormal Roundtable in Paris, Tennessee. And it was an incredible conference, I have to say. I left there having so much knowledge and so much growth, I feel, within this field that, I mean, I am so grateful to have been able to attend and meet everybody and, and connect with you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I will say the same thing, that whenever I left that conference, I definitely felt rejuvenated. You know, this can oh, be yeah. a, a grind, right? Uh, we attend conferences, we go through the motions, uh, but this was special in ways that conferences usually are not. Um, mm -hmm. The audience was very receptive to what we had to say. And also the presenters, I mean, it felt like a family. And I know that sounds a little cliche, but it felt as if everybody was there to support one another and everybody was very open to each other. And that is very rare in any field especially the yes. backstabbing field of the paranormal. <laughs> you know, it's so true. It's so true. Cause you know, it was one of those things where the people that went up there to do their presentations, the presentations were absolutely marvelous. And then it was like watching people go up there and tell their stories. And these are men who are a part of law enforcement. These are people that were soldiers that, that they have fought for our country and they have ended up having these experiences that by the end of their stories, I personally was moved to tears to hear that, you know, they indeed did have an experience, whether it was with a dog man or a Sasquatch or what have you, uh, it, it really changes your entire world. And it really brings you, especially for someone like me who have had, who's had an experience before from a believer to a knower. 
That's right. That's a that's a big point as well, too, isn't it? The, the idea that there is something crazy going on out there and finally just realizing that it's beyond any type of quasi faith, that yeah. it, you no longer have to believe in something to know that it's actually out there. Now, of yes. course, any good conference is always going to end in a question mark because, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, you know, spoiler alert here, nobody dragged a dogman carcass onto the stage for us to <laughs> dissect. But so there's always going to be that question that there's still something out there that is unknown. But really, I like the idea of the unknown because that puts humanity in its place. This is yes. one thing that we cannot lay down on a table and pin down. It's still open to interpretation. There's still ambiguity there. And it really, um, it shows us that we don't know everything about the world around us. And I love that. Oh, yes. No. And I love that as well. And that's the biggest thing that I have learned from being in this field is the deeper you get, the more questions you have, the more you realize that you don't know. And this is something that has been incredible to talk with you about, uh, you know, because we, gosh, we have dove into so many different ideas, you know, especially when we were talking about how there could be shadow entities and these could be ghosts or they could be um, screen memories that are implanted from extraterrestrials. It could be a time slip. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. We don't know what we're dealing with. And, and that is what really keeps me going um, because there are a lot of different theories out there. Uh, but none of these theories is going to be, you know, set down and be, you know, uh, you know, uh, gospel. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I really like the idea that we there's still wildness left on our planet. You know, even though we've destroyed so much of it and there's civilization everywhere and human sprawl everywhere. Um, I really like the idea that there are still recesses out there that are yet to be explored. And in that darkness and in those forests, there could be still something out there creeping around that is intelligent and self-aware that is able to stay hidden from the force that humanity yes. often is. No, that's so true. It's so true. And that makes me wonder, out of everything that you have researched, mm -hmm. what is the one thing, if you can pick one thing, that you would wish was what it was for example we'll take the dog man because that's what we we're talking about earlier that if the dog man was actually a zoological creature that existed within our world something that you can physically touch and see and dissect is there anything in this field that you're like man i would love to meet this face to face and have it be real yeah, you know what? That's a great question. And I think that there's two uh, that come to play. Um, in the world of cryptozoology, a lot of people go to the monsters, you know, the Yeti, the Bigfoot, you know, the, the Loch Ness Monster. But for me, I would hope mm -hmm. that somewhere out there, there is still a thylacine, you know, the Tasmanian tiger, because... <gasps> Yes. We are responsible for destroying it. You know, the last one died in captivity in about 1924, 1926, right around that time. And we really were the reason why this creature no longer exists on this planet. It's our greed and everything. From a cryptozoological point of view, I hope that there's still a remnant population out there uh, going around, mm -hmm. making little baby thylacines. And then somehow, <laughs> right underneath the, the radar, they still... Are, are living out there someplace. Now, that's my, right. my one. The other one uh, that I will have to say, and there have been reports, although nothing fairly recently, but out of Siberia, there were always some tantalizing reports that the possibility of the mammoth still existed. Now, oh. I would love for that to happen. Now, that's yes. not too far-fetched because the mammoth was still alive uh, whenever the great pyramids were put up, uh, which really kind of, you know, really shakes you up if you think about it. Somewhere out there, uh, there was still a small population of mammoth that existed up until about 3,000 years ago, yesterday in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> and I would like to think that somewhere out there, there's one of these magnificent animals that has always inspired me since I've been a little child. And I would love to see one of these things in person and just see how they interact with the environment around them. So those are the two. And I think that it's good to have the thylacine it's kind of like the poster child uh, for the cryptozoological because mm. they're not a monster. And we tend to 
vilify these things, right? When we talk about the cryptozoological, we immediately think monster for some reason, but it's not yes, always that the case, right? And if it is proven that the dog man exists or that Bigfoot exists, I doubt seriously that we're talking about a monster here. We would be talking about an animal that would have instinct. It'd be a predator, of course, and would operate within its environment the way it was intended to operate within the environment. So we kind of cast judgments, right? We are the one that calls it a monster. We're the one that calls it frightening. And I'm sure these things are. But if these things do exist as flesh and blood, then they have as much right to be out there as we do. Yes. No, that's very true. And very, very beautifully put. I love that. Now I want to jump into the more fantastical though. So you've got your mermaids and you've got your fairies and you've got your Wendigo and all these types of beings, if you will. If you could meet one of those. Oh man, that that's a hard one. <laughs> well, I think that yeah. any any red blooded male would kind of like to meet a mermaid, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's just the way they're set up. You know, the idea yeah. of the siren song kind of yes. warring you to the rocks. And then, you know, if we look at the Odyssey, you know, Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus wanted to hear this so badly that he had his crew put wax in their ears and he had to actually strap himself to the mast so he wouldn't throw himself overboard to, to hear this song. But to hear right. the siren song, to hear that kind of luring romantic call that would ultimately lead to your demise, which is much like the interaction with any you know relationship nowadays. But I would think <laughs> that I, would like to, I would like to hear that. That's a good one. You know, I don't know what I think of fairies quite yet. And that was something that we had talked about having a discussion about was fairies as well, because I am new to the uh, UFO extraterrestrial field, and I've been slowly peeking my head around into it. And I have seen that there are some uh, possible connections between fairies and E.T., Oh, yes. So let's talk about fairies for a little bit, shall we? Because this truly is a passion (laughs) for me. Yeah, definitely a passion. So when we talk about fairies, immediately what comes to mind is Tinkerbell, right? We think about the Victorians ruined fairies because the Victorians were going through this kind of revitalization. Industrialization had changed England forever. And there were a group of people that still wanted to have that romantic England, that England of King Arthur. And they were hearkening back to their past to try to reinvent the future for everything. And then the fairies were an integral part of the past in in Western Europe. So I would think that whenever we talk about fairies, we shouldn't look at them the way they were represented by the Victorians because they wanted to make it palatable, you know, palatable to everybody. They wanted this to go down easy. Although fairies were very malicious creatures, uh, their nature was ambiguous at best. Even the kind of fairies, even the fairies of light were best to be avoided because we don't know what they were capable of doing. So that's the kind of thing that I like to go for. So how can we look at a fairy from a different perspective? Whenever we talk about fairies, we necessarily have to bring in the work of uh, a guy by the name of Paracelsus. He was this, uh, he was an alchemist, but he was a little bit more than alchemist. He was actually um, the father of modern medicine in many ways. He was able to uh, deduce that uh, mental illnesses and psychoses were actually indeed illnesses, that these were not plagues by demons, some Mm -hmm. sort of possessions or anything. He believed that this was seriously an illness. And also by studying the world intently, he also believed that there were certain minerals out there that would actually aid the human body in the way to prepare or repair itself. So right. he actually gave the word the, the mineral zinc its name. Uh, not only oh. did he give the, yeah, so not only did he give the mineral zinc its name, he also gave the word gnome. He also came up with the word gnome as well, too. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was one of these fascinating figures. So this is how we saw fairies. Fairies, elementals. So when we think of all the elements out there, you know, the air, the water, fire, uh, the earth itself, he believed in order for all of creation to work in tandem, there had to be an intelligence behind all of that. Which makes sense if you think about it, you know. Oh, yeah. So so in order for the earth to relate properly to, you know, the water and to fire and everything else, you had to have some sort of intelligence behind that. So the gnome 
was the personification of the intelligence dwelt within the earth. The idea of the salamander was the creature, the personification, the idea behind the intelligence of fire. And the mermaid, conveniently enough, was what represented yeah. the water, okay? Now, a lot of this will come out later whenever we deal with, you know, witchcraft and the idea of the reemergence of pagan ideas, especially in, in Wiccan beliefs, because right. there's the idea of animism. And this goes back, you know, to the point whenever shamans, you know, back to the whole way to the Neolithic, oh, that, yes. that everything was imbued with an intelligence. So even inanimate objects like rivers and stones and rocks and mountains, these all had an intelligence to the as well too and that of course you know people tend to personify things so we then saw the world vastly different then than we do now and um, i've often said that one of the biggest travesties that we ever made as human beings is when we created god in our own image uh, right. at that point it became a little bit more problematic because now nature does not seem as so kindred and that's what really hurt us. So civilization came about. We elected to step out of that universal harmony that was already out there. Yes. And I believe that we all should exist in this harmony with the world around us. You and I, we're talking, we're pretty to the same <laughs> choir. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So whenever we step out of that harmony, then we are no we're now we are at dis-ease, right? And that's where you get disease from. That right. we have stepped out of that universal choir, that universal symphony, and we decided we're going to start playing our own music, and at that point now, everything has been thrown off. But uh, there is to me is this intelligence that's in the natural world that can be, you can personify it if you want to, but for the most part, it's just there. And, uh, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle believed in this writer of Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. he believed that fairies were important creatures because they were the ones that converted energy from the sun and were able to give them to plants, which is the reason why mm -hmm. fairies are so synonymous whenever it comes to gardens. And he said they produce so much energy that, you know, they weren't winged. You know, the idea of fairies having wings is very Victorian as well, too. And that appears quite late. But the reason why we envision fairies as having wings, according to Sir Car Arthur Conan Oil, is that this energy which emanates from them actually may look like wings whenever they transcend. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I like that idea. These are just powerful, powerful little nature creatures that go about doing their, their little things. And every now and then we cross paths with them in, in, in various ways. So now I'm starting to think about, you know, the attributes of fairies and the attributes of things such as Bigfoot and even, you know, mm -hmm. UFO encounters. And it starts making sense when we connecting the dots that we might not be talking about about separate entities that one and the same and they're just we, we right. just perceive them differently yeah so fascinating and i want to kind of jump back as well and touch on something that you said the disconnection that we have experienced uh, as a whole it has been incredible because i think that back when we were building the pyramids and back when we had the you know the library and everything we were so connected and we knew how to work with the earth we knew how to work with these energies here again with the levitation and music and sound and and healing all of it but as we have stepped out of that and we have become more technological with our you know the way that we've built our houses the way that we have the cell phones and the computers and all this kind of stuff it's blocking a lot of our natural abilities to be able to tune into these things and we have become so so lost we are now in this time of of the great forgetting i believe yeah, that's a great term as well, too, the great forgetting, because there's so much to be, that's, that's a loaded term, and there's so much to be said about that, because mm -hmm. there is the idea that we have forgotten about who we are and the reason why we're here. We could not, in our present day, with all of our technology, reproduce the pyramids, which is really strange to think right. that something went up, you know, 5,000 years ago that we could not reproduce now, which is so, you know, it's mm -hmm. mind-boggling. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. Until the Eiffel Tower was built, did you know that the Great Pyramid of Cheops was the biggest, the tallest building in the world? Oh. Until the 1800s. Oh, wow. Know? And by the time of Cleopatra, 
Cleopatra is closer to our time than Cleopatra was to the time of the pyramids, which is another thing mm. that blows your mind. And whenever Alexander came upon them, Alexander the Great came upon them, he said, the only thing that time fears is the pyramids because they kind of transcend time. Not only are they an edifice, they're also part of our human legacy of what we are capable of doing. And, and a lot of researchers think that it only took 20 years to put them up, which is another thing, if you think about that, 20 years of just human labor uh, to put up right. something of this size. And no matter how they did it, uh, that's still in incredibly beautiful. But whenever the Egyptians put this up, it wasn't just a big pile of rocks in the middle of the desert. You know, we also have to understand that the way they look now has changed greatly because whenever they were first created, they were made, they were actually encased in marble and they were polished so they would yeah. actually reflect the sun. And it wasn't until the Middle Ages that whenever Cairo became um, kind of a destination point, especially when we talk about things like the Crusade, that they started to loot the pyramids for its building materials. So that's the reason mm. why they took all the marble out of it. To see them whenever they were, were first made, it would look as if the sun was setting, you know, on the land itself. Oh, Which is to beautiful. say that they are meant to reflect the natural world, okay? Uh, some people right. even want to say that they are supposed to line up with the uh, the belt in the constellation Orion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that there's also holes within the pyramids, too, that line up with certain constellations. So we know that it was imperative that they built on this planet, on this art land, to, to reflect what was going on outside of themselves as well, too. So the idea right. that, that what we did here on Earth also was connected to what was going on in the heavens and the change of seasons, and indeed in life itself is something that we forget about in our world today. You know, nobody's building up something yeah. to reflect the natural world like it was before. But um, no, I think that we've forgotten so much about why these things were built and how they were built. We also look at the past from our perspective, no matter what it is, you know. So if it was in the early 1900s, of course, you would not put women in very high esteem. And it's very right. racially based as well, too, because you would say, well, these people were not intelligent enough to do such a thing. Then that puts the, their culture at a disadvantage over what a modern culture is. Whenever I think it's quite reverse, I think the things that we do today are far more barbaric than what was done in the past, because there there was a relationship there with not only the natural world, but with people themselves. Uh, whenever you get a large group of people together, you're always going to have infighting. You're always going to have wars and things, but not to the extent that we're where we have now. I mean, we're capable right. of destroying the entire world with the push of a button. And, and that is, that's a horrible travesty. And that just goes right. to show how far we've stepped out of that natural harmony of life. And we've decided that we were not going to be part of that anymore because not only could we not control it, but also, if you think about this for a second, Lady Anne, if we are part of that universal chorus, if we're part of that universal mm -hmm. rhythm, mm -hmm. guess what that means? It means that we also have a responsibility within that, don't we? Oh, we have one, yes. yes, see, and that's that's uh, that becomes problematic right there because we can cover all aspects of this as well, too. But do you know in the old testament, what is the first question that a human being asks God? I, I always like to bring mm. this up because you know, this is one of those philosophical questions. So it's the very first question that a human being decides to ask God. Can you guess what that question is? Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> Tell so, me. This is going to be kind of earth shaking here. It is, am I my brother's keeper? Oh. Yeah, see, the, if you think about that for a second, and guess what? God does not answer that. So what we are looking at is, especially if you come from a Judeo-Christian viewpoint, and, and I will have to tell everybody in complete transparency, I'm a very spiritual person. I think there is a universal constant out there in the majority of the religions, all religions, you know, I think all religions are pro-social. They also believe that there is this infinite um, web of life in which the divine is part of, okay, that we can interact mm -hmm. with the divine. But, but so yeah. the Bible then goes to show that 
Well, yeah, our brother's keeper. Uh, just to, to leapfrog on that for a bit, too. St. Francis of Assisi, one of my favorite saints. You know, he was known yeah. to to preach to birds whenever there was nobody around. And and uh, there was a famous <laughs> account where there was this wolf of Gubbia uh, that was killing the uh, the villagers of this little Italian town. And he actually went up to it and reasoned with the wolf. And the wolf no longer killed anybody. The villagers fed it. And after the wolf's death, they actually buried him under the altar in the church of Gubbia. Isn't that great? That's a great story, right? That is. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we have all this kind of stuff, but we fail to understand that in the Bible, God is very much from nature, that he, you know, he right. appears in a burning bush. He appears as fire. He appears as wind. And we forget about those kind of things, right? But um, as I was getting back with uh, St. Francis of Assisi, he was supposed to be, and, and probably he, he was, a very great order. You know, he would go out there and he was a great preacher. And, and a young man he was thinking about becoming a priest. He said to St. Francis, said, do you care if I go out with you today and listen to you preach? I really want to learn how you preach. He said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So they set out and they find somebody that has a broken uh, wheel on their cart. So they spend a few hours and help him fix it and off he goes and they encounter somebody else that, you know, was working on their farm and they go help him and they find someone that has a, a problem with a roof and they help them. So they go about doing all these deeds throughout the day. And the young man said, you know, hey, I appreciate you allowing me to tag along. But um, all we did was work all day and you didn't say a single word. And I really wanted to hear you mm. preach. He said, my son, we were preaching all day long. And we forget about these things, right? Because yes. this is the responsibility that we have to everything else around us. And it's a shame. It's a shame that now religion and, and spirituality has been so debased that it's about how much money you put into a collection plate one day a week. And once we step out of those doors, we forget about everything else in the world because somehow we have cleansed ourselves because we went into a building. The natural world is so utterly important. If we lived, you know, a thousand years ago during the Middle Ages, they believed that there were two books written. God reveals himself in the Bible, but there was also something called uh, the Doctrine of Signatures, this book of nature in which God reveals his plan within mm -hmm. the natural world as well, too. And you and I have talked before. All that being said, I do believe in, the, in a Judeo-Christian faith. I also believe wholeheartedly the idea of the Gaia theory, that our planet is a sentient being, you know, it's an intelligent mm. being. And everything out there that is a disease to us, everything out there that harms us, there is an antidote within the natural world as well, too. I do think right. that things like cancer and all that stuff. But what is so sad as we think about how we look at the world it's very possible that these antidotes have been plowed under or set on fire and we've lost them, even though that they were there initially to us. You know, and I agree with this. Uh, it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. One thing that I do want to touch on before we run out of time is when you were talking about being our brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. I believe that we are connected energetically and I do believe that, you know, we are energetic beings. Everything is made up of energy, even our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important to really mind where is our mind going, not going to fear and trying to project the positivity. Because one of the big things that I learned back when I was taking a class, it was the mind detox. Our mentor Chavito had said this phrase, he goes, as you think, so you are, as you are, so you become. And it was so powerful because it really showed that as you're thinking these things, you are drawing this to you. And when you think about that and you go out into the world and you may pass by a stranger and you smile at them, this creates a domino effect. Maybe mm -hmm. they were having a really bad day, but all of a sudden they got this random, genuine smile from a stranger. And then they're going to carry that out into the world. And it's going to go on down the line to the point where, you know, maybe they buy somebody in front of them or behind them a coffee. And then that person ends up getting somebody their groceries or it's a domino effect. And I think that it's really important for us to be aware of this. So that way we can help each other. I firmly believe in that. And, and ever since I spoke with you uh, the very first time, I hope that one day that you and I can appear together someplace yes. to really talk about this because mm -hmm. it is a passion of mine. To the idea that we are responsible for our health, for the state of the world, I think really should come into play. There's a humanity 
out there that we're responsible for yes. because we're part of it. And if we treat it right, it's going to treat us right too, right? So even the idea oh, of yeah. trauma comes up in this as well too. The way we interact with other beings, whether they're you know animals or human beings, it's going to come back to us in some way. And if we're nice and we put out gentle thoughts, eventually that's what's going to win the day, correct? I mean, look, even Martin Luther King yes. said, you cannot fight darkness with darkness. You can only fight it with light. And we mm. see time and time again that you know great evils rise in this world. And it's those little thoughts, it's those little things that can overthrow the greatest of despots. And that's really what keeps me going as well, too. And I have great faith in humanity. Yeah. I do. So, um, yeah. So I would love to be able to get with you sometime and talk in a in an open forum about these things. So if anybody out there is listening, would like Lady M I to, you know, appear, that would be awesome. Because it's hard to find somebody of a kindred spirit when we talk about these things. I agree. And we should have you back on. And, and that should be our next topic that we can get into because I think that it's really, really important. But with our last minutes here, I would love it if you could share with everyone, what's your latest project? Where can they find you? Where can they buy some of your books? Well, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm not very good <laughs> at self-promotion. I mean, this is the, one of those things that I always kind of cringe at because I do like talking, but the idea of, you know, start selling things, I'm not a very good person, but if you were so inclined <laughs> <laughs> buy any of my books. You can find them on Amazon where everybody and their brother can find anything on Amazon. So you can order a set of snow tires and pick up my books as well, too. That's a good thing. <laughs> and speaking of that, I am also available at your local Walmart as well, too. Walmart has picked up some of my books. So if they're not there on the shelves, you can now at least order them through Walmart as well. So keep that in mind. Um, and you can find me on social media, Ronald Murphy on Facebook. You can friend me. I would love to talk with anybody out there. Even if you have an opposing viewpoint because that's how we learn, isn't it? We have open discourse and open discussions about oh, these yes. things. And uh, yeah, so that's basically everything about me. And the two projects that I'm working on right now, a family field guide to beautiful Gettysburg, because I think a lot of people want to go there and they don't know, necessarily know how to approach it, especially if you want to go ghost hunting there. So I'm writing a book on that. And then the other book that I'm working on right now is about earth lights, which I've been fascinated by. And this kind of lends into the world of the fairy as well, too, and all these other great kind of cryptid mysteries, because so often and they are associated with very strange lights that move within the environment as well, too. So hopefully that one will be out within the next few months, I would hope. Went down another rabbit hole uh, concerning these lights. So uh, even more kind of connecting the dots that I'm doing in this book. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I cannot believe how fast our time has I'll gone. I'll tell you what, absolutely. <laughs> it was a true pleasure. I mean, I, we, I've been wanting to, to do this interview with you yes. uh, for quite some time. And like I said, life gets in the way, but at mm -hmm. least we were able to get it out. But it went by far too quickly, Lady M. <laughs> yes, indeed it did. Well, we're just going to have to have you come back on. Anytime yeah. you need me. As long as your listeners don't get sick of hearing me, I will come <laughs> on anytime you want me to come on. Wonderful. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me.
calls to your deepest desire. Light in the fire, burn on your flame.